So that fella couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? Amen. So that fella didn't take the sacraments. Didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary. Didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe. Didn't tithe. He went to heaven. He went to hell. You saved? Didn't keep the law. He didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments. He broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule. He didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory. He woke up in the pit. Are you saved? Amen. You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest by kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. It's like that. You have been saved? If you ever saved, you were saved like that. All right. In this video, I want to illustrate something here that I've talked about before. Let me put some nice cool blue in here to show you that this is representing a pond. And I probably shouldn't have made it wavy, but pretend those are straight lines, I guess. Because I wanted to depict this pond as being flat and still. And if anybody's ever seen that, it, it's pretty cool looking. Just this flat body of water. No ripples. It'd be pretty cool. But I want you to imagine this as just that. It's a perfectly still pond. And what this represents is sinlessness, right? There isn't any sin. There's nothing going on, vegetation going on around, represented by the green. Uh, and I'll talk about this butterfly here later on. And that's what that's supposed to be. I know it doesn't look like that, but that's what that's supposed to be. These brown things are rocks. Just trying to put some detail to it. And the reason why I want to show this is because I want to show the effect of sin, right? So you are going to be here. We'll put Y here for you. Now you are in the flesh and you have a sinful nature where you naturally desire to sin. So you see this still pond, you want to throw a pebble in it and disturb it, right? You know you shouldn't do it, but you want to. But you're like, it's just a pebble, right? So you throw a little pebble here. I'm making it a little big so you can see it. You throw a little pebble in. And this is like you uh, lying. For example, let's say uh, you lie to your siblings. Let's say you're like a teenager or something, right? You, you lie to your siblings about something and they believed you, right? So you got these little ripple effects that end up coming from the uh, little pebble. They might not go across the whole pond, but you know, they, they do bounce off these rocks here. And, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of a disturbance now. And your, your siblings, that's what I'm going to say these two rocks, in a sense, represent at the moment. They hear your lie, they believed it, and they repeat it. So they end up telling your friends, they end up telling your parents, right? And so the, this ripple effect actually goes on a little bit more than you expected right goes out a little bit further when you thought it was just a little disturbance and you want to try to stop this right but you also you're not you're not stupid you realize if you just try to put your hands in the pond and try to stop these ripples you're just going to cause more ripples right you realize this so you're just like okay what do i do uh Ultimately, what you could do to stop this is to tell the truth, but then, you know, you're going to get in trouble, right? 
Uh, but because of this, you caused uh, the bugs. What color would we use for bugs here? Let's use it. Let's use a gray, I guess. So you got little little bugs that got disturbed in the pond, and they're starting to fly around. You know, they're not really necessarily disturbing the pond water, but you see now there's a chain reaction because you see what's actually starting to go on is that there is a rumor being started now based on your line. When it's spreading within your family, and since it's with your friends, it's, it's going into your social circle, you know, your community, your your uh, school, or what have you, your whatever's going on, right? And people are talking about it. So now you got, uh, let's do little frogs here. And, whoa. I guess the mouse button's stuck there. Uh, didn't mean to do that. But, uh, yeah, you got a, some frogs start coming up. And they're attracted because of the flies, right? Now, these will be people who they hear the lie, and they'll start adding to it, right? So, you know, it's basically uh, uh, this rumor starting to turn into a myth. Oh yeah, this this thing happened, and I was there. I saw the whole thing, because these these uh, frogs they like to come out and they like to eat the flies here. So you know their tongue coming out trying to get the bugs that are all flying around. And when, of course, when the frogs start coming out, they they're disturbing the pond a little bit more than your pebble. So you got a more of a disturbance going on, right? And then uh, you've got, uh, let's say now, fish. you got some big fish that they want to come up. And, oops, let's not use black here. Get all confused here. Let's pick a, let's just use orange because it stands out a little bit. And, uh, yeah, this is a weird looking fish, I know. And you get a big, weird-looking mouth. But the fish start coming out. And I know this would be a crazy, scary fish inside of a, a pond there. But they, they come out, and they're trying to eat the frogs. And, of course, this causes a bigger commotion. Right? And, of course, it bounces off other rocks. And you could say these fish are those who... Uh, they know that these these frogs are, let's say, liars, and they go along with this stuff. So they start calling that stuff out, and they don't know the truth, though. So, you know, this stuff is just getting all out of hand. Think people are just saying all kinds of things. They start thinking all these kind of things, and it's all being centered around you over here because of you just seemingly throwing a little pebble into the pond. Right, but now since the fish are moving around, you, you thought this was done, but it's not. Right? Let's use uh, and something crazy here. There's actually an alligator in here. Right? He comes along. Yeah, or just a goofy looking alligator here. Right, and. He likes those big fish, and he comes up to get that fish that started moving around because he was patiently waiting. And now, whoa, there's big disturbance all over the place, and it's bouncing off of the sides, and all of a sudden, this is not no it's still pond anymore. It's all because of this right here being thrown into the pond because of you. Now, I have to ask you, when you cause that kind of disturbance into the pond, what can you do to stop this? And you may say, oh yeah, you come clean. All right, so you come clean. You now tell the truth, but guess what? Now, 
everybody sees what you've caused, and now you have no trust. We'll put a T here, and it's crossed out because nobody trusts you anymore. You told one lie, lie and all this trouble you caused, and they, you let it go on for a while, and now nobody trusts you. And everybody now thinks that anything you say could be a lie, and they start to question other things you said to see if that's a lie. Even though you told one lie, everybody now thinks, well, maybe everything else he said was a lie, or she said was a lie. And uh, they start questioning everything you say in the future. So even though you told the truth, there's still ripple effects going all over this pond. The effects are still going on. It has to do with a lot of mistrust, right? You, you caused a big mess just from throwing that little pebble in there, right? Uh, but on top of this, we've got this butterfly over here. This butterfly I'm using to represent your thoughts. And this same effect of this pond can happen with your thoughts, where you entertain a thought comes your way that you know is wrong. It's a little blip along your thought path here. And you don't dwell on it, right? You, you move along. But then it comes back up. You, and it's a little bit bigger because you spend a little bit more time thinking about it. But you're like, hey, I shouldn't be thinking about that. And you might go a while without thinking about it. And uh, this time, it's bigger. And you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm, I'm dwelling on this thing way too much. Right? And you're like, I'm not going to think about this. And then, uh, boom, boom, all of a sudden you're thinking about it again. And then you start kind of liking the idea of it. And you think about it more. Right? And this is like a butterfly effect here. You're entertaining that thought. And the more you do, the more you think about it. And the longer you think about it and end up. I'm not going to go circle all the way around. I'll just end up doing it here. But then you end up creating the hurricane on the other side of the pond, right? You've heard of that, right? The butterfly effect. The butterfly flaps its wings. And the effect of a chain reaction of like a domino effect ends up creating a hurricane on the other side of the ocean or something like that. And that's how it would be with your thoughts. You started right here with just kind of entertaining the thought for a second. And then, since you were willing to do that, you know, Satan likes to come with that thought again, tries to bring it to your attention some other way. And then it comes to your attention again. And he knows, oh, I can, this person will actually give this some kind of attention. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, this hurricane is you actually now talking about this because it's in your, your thoughts. You're thinking about it a lot. You're, now it's coming out in your words. And then you actually want to go act on it. And this could be something like this lie, right? This whole thing where you ended up throwing... Lost where my mouse is here. But this hurricane is what actually caused you to cause this, this disturbance. Because this little thought right here... You got the thought to throw that pebble in there. It caused a disturbance to see what would happen. Out of your own like curiosity, but even though you know it was wrong, you're told not to do it kind of thing, right? You wouldn't want to be lied to. You know the golden rule. and the, But you keep thinking about it. And then it just kind of consumes you where all of a sudden, I got to do it. And you did it. Right? So you see how it, it played out within yourself first. And then it came out in that same chaos within you, created a chaos outside of you. Right? And this could be done with you just speaking a word, a lie. You didn't have to actually do anything. Now, a lot sometimes your thoughts can get you not just to say things, but to do things. Right? And that obviously causes a disturbance. And... Sometimes words can cause a bigger disturbance than actual actions, but oftentimes actions obviously cause a bigger disturbance. Because with those words, you created a whole lot of action in this pond, didn't you? Right? Just by your words.
And then you might think, you know what? I have some power to my words. Because if people, you didn't tell the truth, right? You saw the effect. You might be like, hey, I'm going to throw a bigger stone over here. And see what happens. And now and then you throw other stones. Because you think you have power. And you like the effect that you you seem to be able to control things. And you, you want to see if you can throw in the stone and actually control where these waves go and the effect that the ripples have and what it causes, right? You're trying to control the reactions and the chain of events, right? You start to become manipulative. You start to become a, a politician, a, a religious leader, right? You start to become a douchebag, right? All because of some thought you entertained and you started to dwell on. And this doesn't have to be with lying. This could be with, oh, you didn't tell a lie. You, you stole something. Right? You stole some heirloom from your grandma and then you ended up selling it so that you can go get a video game or go get a... Uh, some marijuana or something. Who knows what you like to do when you're younger. Go get some booze or something. I don't know. But you did something like that. And now nobody trusts you. Everybody's thinking that you're going to steal something to do do that all over again. Right? Uh, trust is a lot harder to earn than it is to lose. Right? So... Uh, the point being made here is that when you sin, the effect doesn't just affect you and maybe the one person you, you sinned with or sinned against. It has an effect that goes on and affects a lot more people than you think, because this also would affect an influence on others. So if people are friends with you, family with you, if you're the parents of somebody and they see you do this, especially if you're a parent, the children... They're going to do more what you do than what you say, right? They copy what they see more than what they hear from you, right? So if they see you do something, they're going to do it too. And this effect may happen on your younger siblings, right? It may be an effect on uh, uh, schoolmates, stuff like that. And they see what you did. And now you have a bunch of copycats. I'll use a different color. They saw what you did, and I'll just put an O here for others, and they they were like, hmm, I'm going to do it too. Maybe they do it a little bit worse than you did. Like, you wanted to stop after that first pebble, and you tell them the effect, and they're like, no, I'm throwing this big one. And then they cause a huge mess. So this effect goes on, and it's bouncing off, and you got this big mess. All because of the one pebble you threw in. Even if you stop there, you don't know the effect that it's going on and having on other people. So when you want to just, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pay for my sins, kind of thing. I'm gonna wash them away. That's not how it works, right? Because you can't do that. So now, let's say you you saw that you don't have any trust anymore, and you want to get that back. So you want to go over here and be, we'll just put a G here. You want to be good. You don't want to do that anymore. And you grow up, people still remember that. People may still talk about, hey, when they see you, oh, remember when you were younger, you did all that, 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 right? It's not gone just because now you're living a good life. You living good life, a good life doesn't wash this away. It's still there. The effect is still there. You could take this as something more serious as if, like, let's say what you did, whether you did it directly or indirectly, caused, let's just really overshadow this pond. We'll put death here, a big death D here, right? You caused the death of somebody. You being good doesn't wash that away, right? It doesn't. There's nothing you can do to bring somebody back from the dead. So you being good 
after this doesn't doesn't wash it away. You can't wash away your sins by being good. That's not how it works. You know, a lot of people think, oh, you got more good than bad. God's just going to overlook what you've done. No, look at all this damage. This doesn't just wash away because you did what you were supposed to be doing in the first place. See, in the first place, you should be doing good. You shouldn't be doing good to wash away something. You should be doing good because it's the right thing to do. And now you're thinking, well, if I do the right thing to do, you'll wash away the wrong I did. No, you're only doing what you ought to have been doing in the first place. And now you think this washes away the wrong that you've done? That's not how it works. Especially the motive. What is your motive? Is your motive just because you want to do good? Because it's the right thing to do? Is your motive, oh, I love God, I love my fellow man? Or is your motive, oh, I don't want to be punished. I want to earn trust. I want these things for me, 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 me. Then uh, you double down on this. Where it's doubly wrong. Because not only are you uh, doing good thinking it's going to wash away your sins, but you're doing good out of a selfish motive, right? It's impure. So you're, everything you say and is good about you is not really good because good people do good things because they're generally good. They're not doing good things for themselves. They're doing it for someone else. That's what makes it good, right? So if you're doing these things, even if it's helpful to other people, it doesn't matter if your intentions are to wash all this away. Uh, but that also, there's another issue there with this whole thing, is that you also have that sinful nature, right? So even though you may uh, be doing good, do you really want to be doing good, right? You want to sin, right? You want to do that. You found it fun. You found it entertaining. Right? But you also, you don't want to be get punished for it, right? So you desire to throw more pebbles or rocks into the pond to disturb everything. You desire to do it, but you don't want to deal with the consequences so you don't do it. That doesn't make you a good person. Good people don't do wrong things because... They're worried about getting punished. They don't do the wrong thing because they don't want to. You want to do it. You're just controlling yourself. So you're just putting a covering over this. And this covering is your, your good works. Right? You're trying to cover up the fact that you desire to do what is wrong. By doing good. But that doesn't make you good. Because good people don't have to control themselves. So now you see that not only you have sins that you cannot pay for, you can't wash all this away, you can't fix this. And if you tried by jumping in this pond and trying to stop all the ripple effects, you would just cause more ripple effects. And everything would just get out of hand, right? And even though it's already out of hand. Only God can come in and clean this up. And not only that, to change this sinful nature, your desire to actually do this. He can change it. And he does that by living that life that you didn't live, the perfect life where he didn't disturb the pond. He didn't focus on those intrusive thoughts there. And he brought the flesh all the way to death of the cross over here so that he can offer you that perfect life here at the cross. What this cross represents is God coming down and meeting man. And he makes a trade with you where he's like, here, my life, it is perfect. It is righteous and it is eternal. And I offer it to you because you know what? I want you to come to heaven with me. And this is the only way you can come to heaven is if you have my life because you, your life, you've sinned. and You can't clean it up. Not only that, you desire to sin. You don't fit in with heaven. Because heaven would be hell to you, constantly having to control yourself for all eternity, not doing what you really want to do. That is not heaven. That's not paradise. Right? It's like going to uh, like a go-kart track, really wanting to ride the go-karts, but you can't ride them. 
you're going to go play laser tag, but you can't you can't uh, pick up the laser gun. You want to go to the beach, but you can't go swimming. Right. If you go to these places. Uh, to the party, but you, you can't have any drinks. Right. The things that you really want to do, you can't do. It's not fun. It's a more of a hell and more of annoyance. Because all you can focus on is the fact that you want to do it and you can't. So you can't really enjoy yourself. All right? So you need to offer Jesus your imperfect, sinful, mortal life at the cross. And there's a trade made. And this is the only way to heaven. You, you're trying to go this way here, that's another way. You're, you're becoming a thief and a robber, right? The only way is for you now to come over here and just give your life to Jesus. And what he does here is he guts his hand here. I know it's a weird looking hand here, but he has it sealed here to the physical world of the earth and then he becomes a bridge or a stairway a ladder however you want to look to it to heaven where his other hand here is actually i know another weird looking hand here is actually holding open the door to heaven and the only way for you to get there is to come to the cross. And then you actually have to go across Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And you do that, your life is left right here at the beginning at the cross. You die, and as you walk across this, you are entering into Jesus' life. And you're becoming part of his body. You become one spirit with him. And that's how you're able to go in through this open door that he alone can open. Right? This is your only way. And then he will clean all this up. But that takes belief. You have to believe God. You've got to believe he's for you, not against you. You've got to trust him that he did it. And that's what faith is. It's belief and trust. It's the combination of both. Because you can believe somebody. So you, as you, you can believe that God loves you and he wants to bring you home with him, but you may not trust that he has the ability to do it. Like a trust fall, right? You might believe your little sister wants to catch you, but you don't trust that she actually has the ability to do it, right? You would fall and crush her, right? So belief and trust are not the same thing and vice versa. You could say your big brother, you can trust that he can catch you. But you don't believe that he will because he's a jerk and he'll he'll laugh and he'll watch you fall because he thinks it's funny, right? So you may trust your brother, but you don't believe him. Now with God, you need to have both. You need to have that faith, which is believing and trusting. him. You believe that he's for you and you trust that he's able to do it. He's that way. Right? And I hope what this illustration does is breaks down this Tower of Babel within your heart. Because I know a good lot of you, you're trying to go the way of your, your good works. You think this makes you a good person. And I'm all for good works. Do good works. You know, every time I speak out against good works, people think that I'm against them when I'm not. I'm for good works. But I'm for the proper motive uh, and motivation. And uh, also, I want to make the distinction of you do good works because you are saved, because you want to do them. You're not doing them to escape hell and earn heaven. That's what dogs do. You know, Dogs do the right thing so that they don't get a punishment and so that they get a reward. Right? Good people, they do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. They don't do the wrong thing because it's the wrong thing to do. So even if you reward them for doing wrong or if you punish them for doing right, they're still going to do it. Because they're not dogs, they're good people, right? But there's a lot of people who they think they're good works, 
they think this equals a good person. But there's plenty of people, I mean, politicians and religious people, for example, that what do they do? They try to get votes, try to get tithes, right? So votes and money. So they will do things like charity, helping out in some way, doing good works, right? Doing this, but their motive is just to make you think they're good people so that you would give them votes and money. And the votes can represent just approval, right? Because it could be your pastor, your priest, it could be your father or mother, it could be anybody, right? And they could be doing this because of a guilty conscience, because they feel guilty about their past. So their whole motive is purely selfish. And then they act as though it's a love for God and love for their fellow man. So basically what they're doing is they they have Jesus here saying, I'm going to give you heaven freely at the cross. And they say, no, I'm not taking that free gift. So what do they do? They try to come to heaven another way. Well, what's another way we see people trying to get to heaven in the Bible? The Tower of Babel. They see they're trying to get to heaven based on their own works. They're coming together and they're saying, oh, I was born or baptized. Oh, I'm repenting of my sin. Uh, I'm overcoming sin, right? Because I'm not doing it. Even though they want to do it, they're like, well, I'm not doing it, so that counts, right? They're being a well-trained dog, and they think that makes them a child of God. And then they're like, well, I'm paying tithes, right? I'm doing alms. I'm doing charity. I'm going to church on the Sabbath day. I'm partaking of the Eucharist. I'm confessing to the priest. I'm Let's just lower it down a little bit here. I'm, uh, cause I'm trying to make it look like a spiral, but my artistry probably won't really do that. But hopefully you'll get the hint. And then they'll be like, uh, you know, I'm saying my Hail Marys and Our Fathers. I, you know, I'm doing all the religious rituals, right? I'm carrying around a crucifix. I'm, uh, I'm telling people to do the same thing that I'm doing, right? They're building up these bricks, and they're like, um, I, I'm not who I used to be, you know? And then, uh, what other stuff would we say here? Oh, I, I'm calling out the heretics who believe the gospel, that they're saved simply by this thing over here. By what Jesus did by Jesus' works, no, they gotta do their own works. They're building up this tower and he, you know, trying to build their own way to heaven. But Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes onto the Father but by me. Anybody who comes up another way through the, the door to the sheepfold is a thief and a robber. So we see here with this Tower of Babel. This is a stronghold in the minds of people that they are at. They actually think they're building their way to heaven based on their works, right? They're building the bricks. They think, oh, for me to get to heaven, I have to do it myself by building all of this up. And it's all about them and how good they are. And be like, look what I've done. So when they finally get to heaven, it's like, I deserve it. I've earned it, right? No, no one can earn God. No one can earn Jesus. No one can earn the spirit. No one can earn heaven, paradise, and eternity. There's nothing you could do to do so. You think doing all the things you ought to be doing in the first place? Right? These, a lot of these things, not all of them, but these are all oughts. Right? As in, 
you should be doing them normally without getting a reward, without thinking you're going to heaven. Just doing them because it's the right thing to do. Right? But you're doing it because you want to continue getting this tower up higher and higher. Right? Until you yourself get up to heaven. As you keep just going up and up and up and up and you think you're going up. But what does God to do to the Tower of Babel? He breaks it down. And it's a symbol of your works. And this is the, the only works that count. What Jesus did. But you see these people, they're like Cain. Who, who did the same thing, right? Because God said to Adam to till the ground by the sweat of your brow because of your sin. The ground is cursed. And that's what Cain did. Cain started doing this. And then he offers up those fruits that are a consequence of sin to God. And that's the same thing the law is, right? The law is like tilling the ground by the sweat of your brow. Because you trying to keep the law, you have to pull up a lot of weeds out of your mind, right? You have to constantly tend the garden of your heart and mind to produce good fruit, right? But you trying to keep the law is like building this tower. I'll put a law keeper here or a legalist. They too are trying to follow that same line of Cain in offering up your own fruit to God by tilling the ground by the sweat of your brow like God said to do, right? He said to till the ground said to keep the law and he's like yeah but why did it say the law came in because of transgression it says the law came in to show you what i was showing you about the pawn showing you your sin and showing you your sinful nature as paul talks about in galatians it's to show you that no man is saved or justified by the law or their works. We'll put a W in here too. Nobody. It's to humble you to realize this right here, what you're crossing out, is the only way. This is the only way. And you're saying, no. And you go and you try to build this tower. And this is in the heart and minds of everybody. That's why Paul tells us that our battle is not physical. We don't, we're not seeing a physical power being built. But we've been given the spirit to and discernment to recognize that these powers are being built in the hearts and minds of people. And we need to tear them down. And then when these people come down in a great fall, they can be humbled and broken upon the true rock and foundation of the church. Jesus Christ, and then they can accept the gospel and be saved. And then, since they finally accept this here, God takes them up. They didn't have to build that way up, wasting their whole life building something up that God's going to destroy. And to convince themselves that this is the right thing to do, I kind of lost my track thought there because I also wanted to talk about how these people like Cain and the legalists like the Pharisees, they put to death the good Christians. Right? The people who believe in this were able. He offered up the lamb, right? He's focused on the cross and God accepted him. But Cain is like, well, what about uh, the works? God told us to till the ground, and you're not doing it. You're keeping sheep. You're not doing what God said to do. There's no reason why he should be accepting your sacrifice and not accepting mine, where I'm doing what he said to do, right? So then he ends up killing Abel. And then the legalists, the same thing. You see throughout the, the prophets coming to Israel, and then ultimately Jesus and the Christians, the, the Jews put them to death because they're Cain, trying to work their way to heaven 
And then these people are saying, well, we just got a free ticket to heaven. They're like, no, you're a heretic. That's blasphemy. Instead of just letting them be like, OK, they believe that. No, they're going to kill him and think they're doing God's will to do so. Right. And they think that they're full of love. And all that stuff, like the, the Roman Catholic Church has killed a lot of people for simply not wanting to be Roman Catholic. They believe the gospel, they, they believe the scriptures, and they wanted to translate and copy the scriptures for the common people. So the Catholic Church killed them. And then they think that they're Christian, and they're keeping the law, and they're doing the right thing, and they're building their tower up to heaven here. And you see how like deluded these people who, when they get on this, can be. Right? And we we need to be tearing this down. Tearing it down by showing them what they're doing. You know, not a lot of people want to do that. They've been working on this for a long time and they're like, I'm just gonna stop building it. I'm almost there. And they actually think like I'm almost good enough to go to heaven. Why would I stop now? I put all this work in. Like, look at look at that. I, I just need a few more bricks. Right? And that's probably what they've been telling themselves from the beginning. Oh, just a few more bricks. Just a few more. Just to motivate them to keep going. To actually think they're going to do it. But they never examine their heart. They never examine their motive. That it's all about self. About them not going to hell. And about them going to heaven. Right? They don't want to go here. They want to go here. So it's all about them. Where Jesus, his motivation wasn't that. His motivation was this, for us to go to heaven. So I hope this illustration does the trick. We're able to see clearly what's going on here. I'm going to try to find a thumbnail. You know what? I think I'm just going to use a blank white. And I'll just take this as a thumbnail. Matter of fact, let's try to be funny here. Here, here's my cheesy sense of humor here. And here is my thumbnail. It's not even really it's going to be centered either. Thumbnail. And that's what I'm going to use. And anybody who made it to the end of the video will understand. And hopefully it's funny. I don't know. Dad joke, I guess. Uh, anyway, that's that. Thanks for watching. Take care. All right. I just wanted to make a quick video here to put at the end of all my videos, encouraging you to prayfully get into the scriptures as we read here in hebrews chapter 12 at verse 2 it says looking on to jesus the author and finisher of our faith and this is very interesting that it refers to jesus as the author of our faith an author is somebody who writes and in romans chapter 10 verses 16 and 17 it says but they have not all obeyed the gospel for isaiah saith lord who hath believed our report so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of god so you see here how jesus is the author and finisher of our, finisher of our, of our faith and how you get faith from hearing the word of god jesus is the word of god the Bible, the scriptures are the written word of God. It is God in our world. It's God's representative in our world. And that would be the King James Bible. And if you're saying it doesn't say read, it says hear. Well, then read it out loud, my friends. I know some of you are wise asses, and that's what you're going to say. Well, then read it out loud. And you build your faith. And you notice how obeying the gospel here is about believing it. That's how you obey it. The gospel is the good news of our salvation. That Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. But coming back to the word of God here. 
We are told in Isaiah 34, 16, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. This is very fitting because Isaiah has 66 chapters, just like there's 66 books in the Bible. And if you do a study on this, you can see that each chapter of Isaiah lines up with each book of the Bible. The first chapter for Genesis, the last chapter for Revelation. Have fun doing that. And why should you seek out the book in the, of the Lord and read? So that Jesus never tells you this. Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God, as we read here in Matthew 22, 29, when he's talking to the Sadducees who are coming to him with a very silly question that anybody could answer if they actually knew the scriptures. But you see, the Sadducees, they didn't use the whole Old Testament. They just used Moses. So they didn't get the light from the Old Testament to help you understand the Torah. Just like the New Testament shines light and helps you understand the Old Testament. None of it adds or removes from what Moses wrote. It helps you understand what Moses wrote. That's why Isaiah tells us here in Isaiah 8 verse 20, to the law, which is the instructions, the Torah, what God told Moses to write, that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of your Bible there. It says, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So you see, you test the people to see if they actually have light in them. There's people who have an outward show of light, as Satan himself can come as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. But how do you test the spirits to see if there's truly light in them? They have to line up according to the scriptures. Jesus was not afraid to be tested in the scriptures. He would say, have you not read? Uh, it is written. To search the scriptures. Bring them up. They testify of me. Right? He wasn't worried about that. Paul wasn't either. Acts 17, 11. He wasn't worried about being tested in the scriptures. He didn't make some nonsense about you can't understand the scriptures. You need me to interpret them. No, he, he actually called the Barians noble for hearing what he had to say and then searching the scriptures to see if it was so. Because that's what we're supposed to do. If you don't line up with the scriptures, you're not of God. Very simple, very easy. God made it very easy for us to know him and to know who is not of him. He gave us his word and it's super simple. If it doesn't line up with him, then obviously it's somebody else trying to say that they're from him, a stranger. Trying to kidnap you, right? And what does Jesus tell us about the word? In John 17, 17, he says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So you Christians that want to be sanctified, and you're trying to sanctify yourself by repenting of all your sins so that you become sinless, you want that sanctification. You need to get into the word because when you have the word abiding in you, God changes you from the inside out where you're not making the change, where you sanctify yourself by becoming some sinless being, by focusing on your sins and fighting against them. No, that's just cleaning the outside of the cup and containing your sinful nature. You need to come to Jesus to be born again, sealed with his Holy Spirit and become one with his spirit. And as Jesus says in John 6, 63, his word is spirit and it is truth. Flesh profits nothing. You get into the word. You are partaking of the Spirit of God, and God's Spirit is life-giving, as we see in Genesis, bringing life to things that have no life. You want that life. You want to be sanctified. You need to get into the Word. As we're told here in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So how do you receive this cleansing? By getting into the word. It is spirit. The spirit is in reference to water. You want that cleansing? Get into the word. That's where you are going to be sanctified, so that you would be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. No blemish whatsoever. You need to get into the word so that Jesus is abiding in you, and you are abiding in him. 
You see that? So, moving on to this last verse here, John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Because the only way to know the Father is to know the Son. You can't come to the Father without going through Jesus. When you know Jesus, you know the Father, because they are one. Jesus is the Father in the flesh. And eternal life is to know them. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 7, to these people who are doing a lot of great works in his name, they're prophesying in his name, they're casting out devils in his name, they're doing many mighty works in his name. And Jesus says, I never knew you. You see, you're saved not because of your works, not because you repented of your sins, not because you're perfect and you've deserved it and you've earned it somehow, that you've proven yourself. No, you're saved because of your relationship with God. If you've come to the cross and have been born again, then you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. You become one spirit with the Lord. There's no way Jesus can say, I never knew you, because he knows you. He made you anew at the cross. He knows you intimately. You're saved at that point. You need to have that deep relationship with God. Just as Adam knew Eve and she conceived, you need to know God on that level where you are born again. You receive the word of God, which is the seed of God, into your heart, which would be your womb. And there was a man, you might not want to think of that, but that's how it is. Eat the humble pie so that you receive the seed of God that you may be born again. You see, the women help us understand our role to God. Because to God, we are the bride, the bride of Christ. We are as the woman. So you need to eat the humble pie, receive the seed, so that you can be born again. But a lot of Christians, they are just like a lot of women today. We don't need a man. So they're never going to be born again. Right? A lot of Christians, we don't need God. We can do it ourselves. They take on the name Christian. Christians seem to be the easiest people to fool. Because all you got to do is say you're Christian. And they'll follow after you. You can be preaching lies because they don't test you to the scriptures. Donald Trump is a good example of a lot of Christians just blindly following him because he said he was Christian. Even though when he asked was asked if he comes to Jesus to ask for forgiveness. He says, no, no, I don't really do that. I, I don't really see myself as a bad person, and I just try to do better. So he's not a Christian. He's never been born again. He doesn't believe the gospel, the good news of our salvation. He doesn't even believe he needs it. Yet the Christians are holding him up as if he's Christian and as if he's the, the savior of our country. Right? They're making an idol out of him. And he obviously, he's a pompous ass, right? And the only reason why he looks good is because the left looks so bad. If it wasn't because of the left looking so hideous, you would be able to see clearly that Trump is no better. He just says what you want to hear. But then somebody like me, who preaches to you the truth, but then I might say a word you don't like. Like I might say shit or ass, and all of a sudden you're offended and you turn off the video right here saying this guy's not a Christian, you never listen to a thing I say, because I said a couple of words that the Bible doesn't say not to say. The Bible doesn't say not to say any words like that. It says not to have corrupt speaking and guile. Corrupt speaking is what you get from politicians like Trump. That lie. And that's what guile is. It's manipulation. Fake feigned words. Flattery. I'm not doing that. I'm not speaking anything corrupt. I'm just instead of saying crap or butt, sometimes I end up saying shit or ass. And me saying that right now, you probably getting mad. And that's probably because you're immature. Christian, or not even Christian at all. You're just Christian in name only. And that's why you follow 
fake Christians so easily. So if you're offended by such things, have fun. Go away. You're not breaking my heart. You're, you're not taking anything from me. You're only hurting yourself by rejecting the truth and following after bullshit. So thanks for watching. Now I'm going to splice into something from Rockman that I really enjoy for the end of this. Take care. That fella couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? Amen. So that fella didn't take the sacraments. Didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary. Didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe. Didn't tithe. He went to heaven. He went to hell. You saved? Great. Didn't keep the law. He didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments. He broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule. He didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory. He woke up in the pit. Are you saved? Yeah. You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest by kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. It's like that. You have been saved? If you ever saved, you were saved like that.